Welcome once again to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's go to the papers and see what major stories have made the headlines this Tuesday morning. Uh, we'll start with the Punch newspapers, a uh, big one, uh, should be on your screen in just a few seconds, yes. It says, tension rises in the southeast, military begins operation against killings and others. Military police show of force, uh, show of force rather, creates confusion in Imo. Offices, markets and others shot. Army launches exercise Golden Dawn in Anambra against IPOB cultists and others. Southeast governors and other leaders meet in Enugu today to revive Ibubeagu. Also on the punch, Nigeria service debt with 1.47 trillion naira in the first half of 2021, says the Debt Management Office. Nigerian Airlines to lose 1.4 trillion naira um, as poor COVID-19 vaccination slows recovery. Billions of dollars lost as Facebook shuts out 2.9 billion subscribers. Also, Nigerians used 1.74 billion liters of petrol in August, says the PPPRA. The punch still on Nwadume. Army shields killer soldiers, refuses to court-martial kidnap collaborators. And CSOs berate federal government and VIPs as Pandora Papers implicate Peter OB and nine others. Also on the punch this morning, Strike suspended for salary payment on IPPIS. No work, no pay unresolved, says the NARD. Woman dies in apartment uh, missing, and a missing two-year-old's uh, two body found in Canal. It's a sad story. South-South states back rivers on VAT suit, planned security outfit. Over 500 Niger local government communities under Boko Haram, says a resident. 500. And also, 567 million naira required to hire 1,000 workers for Lagos Ibadan Rail projects. We can also find on the punch this morning one final story. Um, special status, Lagos demands 1% of Nigeria's revenue. All right, we're moving from the punch newspapers now. Let's see what we can find on the Daily Independent. It says, exiting police may roll back schemes 13 trillion naira AUM gains. And um, SACO, ex staff protest non payment of 1.8 billion naira severance package. Fiscal federalism, Lagos demands 1% in revenue allocation formula. PDP NEC may be rancorous as zoning. Um, Bala report and others dominate meeting. Despite attacks, INEC vows to proceed with Anambra gubernatorial polls. Stampede in a worry over sit at home purported enforcement. And also, Supreme Court reserves judgment as state wants federal government to refund 66 billion naira. South South states join Rivers and Lagos value added tax fight, set up security outfit. Uh, I think those are the ones that we will take on the Daily Independent this morning. Daily Trust newspapers next attacks. INEC takes a final decision on Anambra gubernatorial election today. Political parties and stakeholders hopeful. Tenure extension possible if. And that is uh, from lawyers. On VAT, South South Governors joint suit against FIRS. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg loses $7 billion as WhatsApp, Facebook, and Instagram go down globally. Why I called Tinubu Mr. President in London, says Rep. Suleja. I remember there was a video that uh, was uh, um, uh, released yesterday uh, showing um, a, re a House of Rep member, I believe, uh, calling former Lagos State Governor Bolamet Tinubu Mr. President, and that's what he's referring to. Boko Haram asks uh, Niger residents to flout government orders, shun schools. That's also on the Daily Trust newspapers. And finally, the leadership. Social media outage causes global shocks as Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, and Instagram crash. Online businesses suffer losses. Um, we can also find here, military sets a three-month target to crush terrorists. Resident doctors call off 63-day strike. And also, we won't allow IPOB sit-at-home order in the North. Financial autonomy. Supreme Court reserves verdict on suit by 36 states. And uh, we can also see the uh, governor of Lagos State, uh, Song Wo Lu, in the news saying revenue allocation rev uh, review long overdue. Value-added tax once again, South South State to join Rivers and Lagos uh, suit against federal government. Good morning to Mr. Chris Wandu, the public, uh, publisher of uh, CKN News. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. 
Great to have you on the program this morning. I'm going to start with the southeast and, of course, uh, the one on the punch this morning saying tension rises in the southeast as military begins operation against killings and others. Uh, there's something called Operation Golden Dawn in Anambra State against the IPOB. And um, Southeast governors and others meeting in Enugu, basically, to talk about reviving Ibu Biago. So let's start with the um, military operations and what your take is on, on those. Yes, thank you. For the, for the benefit of the doubt, um, yes, that operation was launched in Enugu yesterday. But um, it is uh, uh, it will also be you know that it is not only for the Southeast. There are three operations that are launched yes. in Enugu. Uh, one is for the South East, then there is one for the North, and that of North Central. Um, but it was just, uh, uh, it was just um, a coincidence that that was launched in the Enugu. But the operations at the Amnesty is not only for the South East. I think we should put that uh, out straight. Yeah. Um, there will be one for the North, and another one for the North Central, or thereabouts. No, so, yeah, but, 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 but the, the tension always rises from the one in the southeast. Because if you remember where there was the Operation Python dance, uh, Igweke, as they had, uh, they had um, called it then, um, there's always some controversy whenever you know, it's going to start in the southeast. It's not because it's just in the southeast. Yes. Why is was that? It's because of um, the uh, activities of iPod um, then. Um, so I'm felt that uh, that operation was directed um, at... Um, the iPod and the activities of iPod in the South East. But before then, you also remember that there has been this, um, this uh, operation and exercise by the army uh, in, the, in the whole of Nigeria, especially when it comes to the South East, when it comes to the Ember Month, they have always um, had this operation to try to, to cop the issue of kidnapping, banditry, and the rest of them. Before that, there's always, it has also happened in the South South, uh, if you remember vividly. So, that of the status only came to the front page because of the activities of iPod. So many felt that that operation was directed at iPod. And it's when the some of the pictures started coming out on social media on the past many um, South Easterners we have been treated, some we have um, been robbed in the mods, others have been uh, um, dehumanized. So that was why that of the status at that point were. But as I said. It is an operation that is covering the whole of Nigeria. And, and it's coming at the right time because the level of insecurity across Nigeria has gotten to a point where it has become so intolerable. Because if you see what is happening now, no part of the country is safe. That is the north, either in the south, southwest, southeast, south, south, north central, name it. We are practically under siege by the activities of kidnappers, um, terrorists. I don't call the bandits, as I've already said on this program, um, terrorists and all sorts of uh, criminal um, activities. But I feel that the, the military should just go beyond just having the operation, but also be able to see if they can be able to arrest and prosecute those behind all this area. And not only the statues, there have been the issue of Boko Haram that has been on the front banner for years. Nothing has been done about it. We are talking about bandits also now. Nothing has been done about it. What of the I, I, I watch you, you are talking about 100 uh, or so Boko Haram sponsors and the rest of them that the federal government has told us time with that number that they are going to prosecute. Nothing has been done about that. So that is that, that is where the disparity comes, where people see what is going on and your activities you are trying to uh, open the south. Then that's why to jeopardize that and feel that there are some kind of um, um, indirect shielding of certain sections of the country who are perpetrating all sorts of evil and the criminality compared to what is happening in other without condoling what is happening in East South East. But I think that this should be holistic. The military should be able to make sure, and the federal government should combat it to making sure that all those that have been arrested for terrorism and all sorts of criminal acts are prosecuted. That is the only way you can bring confidence to Nigeria to make sure to tell them that no part of this country seems, quote and unquote, untouchable. Yeah, um, you know, is it also important to you know to once again talk about, you know, how you know Ni the Nigerian military seems to have cheapened itself, you know, with its constant presence on the streets and in and, and in civilian areas, um, because I, I don't think this is common, you know, in other climes that you know the military has operations where they you know invade, not necessarily invade, you know, but they come out in civilian you know areas and really just carry out whatever operations that there are. We still have the police that should be able to do the same work that they you know, are claiming to want to do um, for the last quarter of the year. 
We still have the DSS. We still have the NSCDC and all the security outfits that should be able to carry out these same, um, you know, caution of uh, kidnap gangs or cultism or whatever it is that they call it. Even in the police, there's different segments in the police. There's the anti-cultism, there's the anti-terrorism, there's the anti-this and anti-that in the police. So why do we need to have the army come out every year and, you know, and, and, you know just be around civilians? Yes, we don't necessarily stand there as a PR uh, officer of Nigeria. But the Nigeria Army has become a child of circumstances. Uh, if the, um, the police, the DSS, the civil defense are doing what they are doing, they are to do, then definitely we wouldn't have had the military out there. But it's because that the, our DSS, the police, and uh, civil defense, and whatever you call it, cannot cope with the situation. They don't, they don't seem to be able to handle the situation as it were. So what else, what would the um, uh, government do than to deploy the military uh, to be able to help out? And that is, um, I also look at that from uh, uh, a part of leadership. You know, is it that because we've not been able to, have we been able to fund the police effectively to be able to uh, go about their mandate? That, I think, is the problem. We seem to be pumping so much money into the army and leave the police. We're supposed to take the responsibility of securing uh, for, uh, that is not with the responsibility of internal security. That is the issue. So if you're not funded to police enough, what do you expect them to do? Are they going to go? Look at the kind of um, uh, arms the policemen carry. You see them with Jack Chakabula. But you see the terrorists going with AK-47 and the rest of them. How many men do we have in the, the police? I doubt if we are, are, I don't think they are more than 500,000 in number. Then to, uh, to, to, to police a population of about, of about 200 million. Then what of the DSS? The DSS office in Anambra in the Navy was just attacked. If they were equipped enough, would that, can they be, do you think that they, will be, they can easily be overrun by, uh, like that by uh, unknown gunmen or whatever you call them? So that is it. So the soldiers, the army is just a, a child of necessity. And I feel that that is a. You cannot go to the streets of the United States of America or United Kingdom and see a military or the army walking around. Very few of them you see. It's either they're on mission or you see them at the airport, try to put planes and the rest of them. But you see soldiers moving around the way our own people are moving. It's not possible. And that is one. Then two also, the, the soldiers have also gotten themselves uh, encrypted into this uh, uh, civilian uh, society. Because unlike in, in most parts of the world, they are, they are put in the barracks. But you see that over 60 to 70 percent of our military men <laughs> live in civilian, live outside the barracks. So, what do you see them in the morning? You see them waking up, waiting at bus stop to go to their offices and um, their places of work and the rest of them. So, it has become a, a part of force. But as I said, let us do the needful by making sure that we equip our security agents, especially the police, so that they can effectively do their job. But if we don't be able to do that, we continue to have this kind of incursion of the military in our in civil. Um, arrest and the rest of them, and which is not good for us. All right. The military J is not before, trained to handle civil issues. Yeah. Just before we move on, because I think we need to move to something else, but I, I want you to also speak on army-civilian relationships, <laughs> uh, which has also been greatly battered um, across the country um, and also in the southeast, because that also comes to question. You, you spoke about pictures of people rolling in the mud and some of all of that. There's also instances where people have complained that, you know, you know, you're walking around in places in the southeast and they tell you to raise your hands or, you know, or come down from your vehicle and walk, you know, to pass it, an army checkpoint and some of all of that, which, which really is very, very unnecessary. And so the importance of fixing that relationship um, between the, uh, the Nigerian army and civilians, um, how, how do you think that, how well do you think they've done with that? The military, the Nigerian army, for one, that I know, even have created a, a, a civilian um, military relations department that I know of. In fact, there's also a public relations uh, department in the, uh, in the Nigeria army, I don't know what they call it now. One is headed by Colonel, uh, what's his name, and what's his name. It's somewhere in Lagos, uh, in Lagos here. Yeah. And uh, the essence of that is to be able to bridge the gap between the military and the civilian populace. The how far they've gone on that is what I cannot understand. Because when you see the level of um, distrust and mistrust between the civilians and the military, the military just feel that when they carry their gun, they are more superior than uh, the civilian uh, the civilian on the street. Forgetting that the gun they are carrying is being bought by uh, the taxes from the civilians, mostly. So I think the military should do more 
and bridge the gap between the trust between them and the civilians so that I can be that. Look, just, just let me go back to what happens in other parts of the world. When you see the military in other parts of the world, they don't behave the way our own soldiers behave here. You see a soldier walking about and see a woman having issues with her child, and the soldier quickly runs, carry the baby, and try to help the woman. You see, um, um, you see um, um, a, a motor accident scene. Before the, uh, if the soldiers are available, you see them quickly doing that. You see where there, there is a collapse of bridges and uh, um, some certain infrastructure of the military moving to help people in civilian areas. Yes, I know that there's, there's an extension within the military that does that in areas of infrastructure um, development, but the mistrust between them, you don't need to see a soldier and start running, and start feeling threatened. That is the situation we find ourselves in. I think okay. there should be a much more robust relationship between the civilians and the, and even of recent, I see that the military has also been able to act, uh, up his game by organizing social media meets with um, uh, bloggers, uh, social media influencers, and rest of with the, with the, with the intent to be able to drive home some of their messages. But it is not hitting hard. So I think that the the, the top actors of the military can still do more by making sure that they, we can have a, so, a soldiers and military with human face, where people can interface, where people can even walk up to and say, I have certain information that I can give you, which you can use to be able to pass some of the problem. But the problem is that there's a mistrust between the people, and, the, and that is why this insurgence is rising on a daily basis, because people no longer trust the military. They cannot give them the necessary information that they need to work and tackle the, the insurgency, and that in itself is a problem. So I think we should work on the um, mistrust and the trust deficit between the military right. and the civilians so that they can get all the necessary information to be able to cop the level of insurgency that is um, that is just uh, right. going wrong. Let's, let's move away country. from let's move away from there now. Let's uh, now talk about value added tax and controversy. It's all over the papers this morning. South South states uh, joining rivers um, in the suit uh, mm -hmm. against the federal government and the FIRS. Uh, share your thoughts on that one. Yeah, it's a very good one. The South South governor said they would join Lagos and, and, um, and Rivers. Don't forget, um, governors of the North have already also beat their tent with FRS, and they said going, they want to be joined in the suit with FRS. So it is good. At the end of it, it's, it's, it's the Supreme Court that is going to determine this. But what we are seeing now is a gradual, um, uh, what do I call it now, a gradual look at our constitution uh, as it were. Since the National Assembly have not been able to do the needs, so given all the opportunity they were given to be able to look at some of the essentials of the Constitution, they set up a committee to look at the review the Constitution till now. We see that nothing has happened. Now, the states are not taking the initiative on their own to look at some of the new sizes that have been seen in the Constitution and see where, where they can correct the wrong. So, uh, it, the Nigerian system will be better for it. Our Constitution will be more straightened. Um, then, the states, if they're able to have the special negotiation in the South, especially rivers, um, um, Lagos and so that's the group that they are being marginalized. Their resources are being used to develop other states. We now have more resources to themselves if yeah. they win their case in, in the Supreme Court. Okay, and of course, I'm um, still talking about more money. I think I saw something on the Lagos state governor uh, demanding, yes, it says Lagos demands 1% of revenue mm -hmm. allocation. Um, of course, um, the governor is talking about a special status for Lagos state, seeing what they contribute. Mm -hmm. Uh, to the okay. nation's earnings. Uh, so do, do you agree with that? Lagos have become the proverbial or the twist that we always ask for more. I think, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, and I think that Lagos will just concentrate on its internally generated revenues, making so much internally, it is internally generated revenues, making so much from part, it's making so much. Lagos is so blessed. Um, some states are quarreling with Lagos very, very well, and Right, so Lagos had the status of being the federal capital of the of the country for over seventy years. Most of the infrastructures that you see that are presently being enjoyed by Lagosians or the Lagos state is because of that status. Lagos have had it so good, more than other states. Calabar used to, at one point, used to be the uh, federal capital of Nigeria. That's even part of the point independent. But you cannot compare Calabar to Lagos. So I think Lagos is just. Um, continue to enjoy its success as it's here presently. I don't know what they're asking for 1% or 2% for. They have enough to go around, and um, they are the envy of so many states. And um, so I think the, the states should concentrate on internal generated revenue, 
uh, uh, so many infrastructure is going on here. They can make so much money on that. Even without federal government assistance, Lagos State was able to make it. Don't forget what happened during the Tinubu administration, where the Lagos State government was denying of his um, revenue from the federal government by the Obasanjo regime. And Lagos State survived. So uh, I don't support that. There's other people supporting that. I personally don't support that. I think Lagos State has been to be able to uh, handle it. What I just feel is that this should also be spread around other states. Other states of the population are practically dying. Some cannot even raise up to one billion, less than one billion yearly, but monthly, on internally generated revenues. So I totally disagree with um, Governor Sanwolu and the government of Lagos State to ensure the 1% um, addition from the federal government. I don't think it's necessary. Lagos can survive. You okay. know then how many support is there? By the time Dangote refineries come, come on street to become the biggest refinery in the whole world. Do you know how much Lagos State will be making from there? And so many other infrastructures that are uh, restored by Lagos to, to Lagos. So I totally don't support that. Okay. Well, since you mentioned uh, Tinubu, uh, just before we get to talk about the NARD suspending its strike, let's uh, first of all start with um, Rep. Suleja, who is uh, responding to, you know, and saying why I called Tinubu Mr. President in London. So quickly share your thoughts on that one. And of course, uh, I'm sure you must have also seen the numerous pictures of people um, uh, traveling to London to visit uh, the former Lagos State Governor, uh, from House of Reps, uh, members, senators, you know, and, and everybody you know you can imagine. Uh, so quickly share your thoughts on, on Ms. Um, Rep Suleja's uh, statements. I have no problem with anybody traveling to London to go and see uh, Ashwadi Tolbalatinu. Um, he has a right to receive visitors. And uh, the only question I've always asked, those traveling, the special government officials, I hope they are going with their money. I hope they are traveling to London with their own money and not from state ports. Because if it's from the state ports, then we have issues. Because those are money that can be used. You can only put a call to Ashwadi Bola, I mean, to go from anywhere you are, I ask um, uh, my leader, as they call him in APC, I hope you are getting better. You can go these days of WhatsApp call, these days of duo, these days of telegram call, um, video calls and rest, and we can talk. So, but I see most of this is just like fancy on the part of politicians. That is their way. That's the way they rule. They are not going there because they're not going there. They are just going there just for political exigencies and to be able to uh, um, all their better. But that is, to be specific, that the statement made by that um, so-called honorable dishonorable is very stupid of him. Sorry for the choice of word. There is only one president in Nigeria, and that is Mohamed Buhari. So whatever you insinuate and call any other president, president, that to me is stupidity that shouldn't come from me, from anybody that calls himself a, a, a leader or a politician in that way. So, but that the visit uh, people have made, I don't have an issue. Yeah, but, I don't well, have an issue. But would, would it be per per permissible if he's expecting, you know, that he would run and very likely, you know, or maybe would win in 2023? Uh, would uh, Suleja's uh, statements... <laughs> Uh, he has a right to run. He has a right to run. You have a right to run. I have a right to run. No Nigerian has this deprived. The Constitution has made it clear on those that can run for president. If he meets those criteria, he can run, irrespective of whatever anybody says. Anybody can run. I'm over 50. I have the right to run if I have the opportunity to run. So everybody has the right. Nobody deprived. And it is now for the electorate to determine whether they are going to support him or not. Tinubu has a right to run, just like every other person. Yeah. All right. Now let's talk about the resident doctors uh, who have suspended their 64-day strike. Um, very likely we'll be speaking with a representative from there, the president, I believe, um, of the NARD this morning. But quickly share your thoughts on the strike suspension. They say... It's a good, um, it's a good one. It's, yeah. a, it's a good Go one. On. When two elephants might be just so fast. It's actually been the Nigerians that have been suffering the, this, um, this macabre dance between NRD and, and the federal government. That's, I, I commend the NRD for what they've done to bring to the fore the challenges they face and the inability of government to be able to respect contracts signed with them. But good enough, they call, uh, they call up that strike. And I hope that the government will also fulfill its part of the bargain, and making sure that all their demands are met so that we don't come back to have this kind of unnecessary tension again. Okay. CSOs berate federal government and VIPs as Pandora Papers um, implicate uh, Peter Obi and nine others. Your thoughts? <laughs> PW has come to uh, make a statement on that, and I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. If there's anybody that has to be raising that PW stole money from, from the Nanamba from State government, should come out. PW has been the only governor, I think, of that came out 
when he was leaving office to give an account of his office and all the money that he left, both in card and shares and the rest of them, and presented it to the people of Anambra State and Nigeria. You can Google it, you will see it there. Peter B to me is a politician that most other politicians, to me, is a man I trust. If there's any discrepancies uh, in his asset declaration and rest, that, that, that can be taken up. But what we should, should be more concerned is that they did steal any money. If Peter B has stolen money, I can, you can be rest assured with the problem is having of Peter B and not, they would have brought that to the limelight in the past six, seven, eight years. So I want to give him the benefit of doubt. But as I said, um, if anybody has any evidence that this Peter B should bring it to the poor. But the man has come time and time again and said that I did not steal any of Anambra money. Don't forget, Peter B was a billionaire before he became the governor of Anambra State. So I'll give him the benefit of the doubt, irrespective of what uh, the Pandora. Um, investigation came out. Uh, are, you, are you also eager to see what new, because I've, I've seen that there's something on Governor Bagudu that dropped this morning, also on Pandora Papers. Um, are you also eager to see what, you know, which of Nigeria's political elite uh, would be named and uh, what uh, might, we might find? I, I, can't, I can't wait to see that. Don't worry, forget, even in the Western world, the names of certain president or former president have been uh, as, <laughs> I'm sure you must have seen that report. Yes. I've part of that report. Yes. In, Western, in the Western world, some of them already defending themselves and the rest of them. It reminds me of uh, what's that guy now? What is that? Wikili? Is it Wikili? What's that guy? Yeah. Wikili? Um, uh, Juliana Sand. Yes, what he used to do in those days. I think Pandora has taken over since the guy has been um, arrested and kept in from Nicaragua. Just taken over from where? And the bet. The, the, why this is a bit much better is because over 600 journalists were involved with this, and certain media houses were involved in this. Um, uh, uh, investigation. So that is taking us to a higher height compared to what Wikileaks has been doing. But I can't wait to see the names of some of these top officials that have been named in this uh, so-called scandal. But let us also give them the benefit of that today to defend themselves. They are only yeah. suspects. They are not convicted. Absolutely. And of course, uh, one of the stories that, you know, I, I was shocked at, um, it says over 500 Niger local government communities under Boko Haram and that's from a resident. Um, what are your thoughts on that one? And um, is that surprising? It's not surprising. It's the same thing is happening in Bono State, and so many other parts of the North, which is why we go back to the of security. Let us be able to do the need so that we can secure the lives and property of our, our people, that, so that Nigerians, wherever they are, can be safe. The way we are now, nobody be safe. I find it difficult to even travel around the country as I used to do it before, and that is the most unfortunate part of it or not. Nobody is safe in any part of Nigeria now. Really sad. All right, I think we can wrap up here at 749. Thank you very much, Chris Wandu. Always very interesting speaking with you on Tuesdays, and uh, we wish you a very interesting day ahead. Well, I mean, I do have a nice day. You too, sir. All right, stay with us here on The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. We're going back in history to 2017. If you remember the Me Too movement, um, one very, very major investigation uh, was published on this day. And we'll tell you about it when we come back.